I'm going to talk about the future of young people. There are about 2 billion of them in the world, and I'm interested in all of them. I'm interested in the rich and the poor, the haves, the have-nots in terms of technology. I want to find ways to help them all in this new environment we're in. And so I've stood up this thing called the Global Institute for Empowerment, Accomplishment, and Impact by Young People. I'm talking today about reframing and recalibrating for a new age. Reframing is the or, and we all know that you can see the, the cup or you can see the profiles. It's very hard to see both at once. The question really is, which is more useful? And then recalibrating is the and. When we need both of something, we need to think about how much of each we get. Nothing ever completely goes away, but it's really important what becomes mainstream and what becomes a niche, like Latin became a niche. And my process is really to first reframe things, and I do this in a wide variety of areas, and then recalibrate. Now, I hope you all agree that our goal is to prepare and equip young people for their future. I want to start by reframing our kids. I focus on young people. What we used to do was teach them a curriculum. We did it through learning in advance. The reframe is to empower them through accomplishment, impact, and self-direction. We do this in schools. And we have schools and learning in advance everywhere in the world. We have old ones, we have new ones, modern ones, but all of it is learning in advance. That's really the paradigm we use. And that paradigm, as I think most of us agree, is having some problems. So a great many people in the world are attempting education reforms. Probably every country in the world is doing this. Every billionaire in the world has their own education reforms. Trouble is, they're almost all incremental changes. They're all what I call icing on top of the old learning in advance cake, which by now is stale. That's reading, writing, math, language, science, social studies, I call it the mess. And I hope we all agree here that not only does learning in advance no longer work well, but the future that we're going into is going to be very different. And in the, many of their behaviors, our kids are already very different. So the question that I ask is, can learning in advance, even with all the icing we put on top of it, ever meet our needs and our kids' needs? Or do we need an alternative option? And I think we do. It's complicated. I'd rather you read the book. And that book talks about all these things, and it's on Amazon, and there's the URL should you want to read it. And so it's really about reframing a new way of growing up for the 21st century, from young people being almost entirely directed by adults to much more self-direction through what I call becoming empowered. And I am empowered means something very specific to me. It means I can. I choose, then I accomplish, and I see a positive impact. And if you can't do all those four, you're not empowered yet. Visually, here's a picture that I like. We used to put things into kids' heads. We spent all their early lives trying to put things in as parents, as culture, as school. Now it's important to bring things out of kids' heads so that we can get new ideas in the world, so they can, we can see how they want to see the world. And there's a way to get there. We can get there through a process of continuous real-world projects by young people of all ages, by creating these things called empowerment hubs that I'll talk about, by providing more self-knowledge that we don't do very well, and by using what I call empotech. That's a term that I invented. EdTech is all about putting things into kids' heads. Empotech, which is empowering technology, uses the internet and YouTube and always on real-time access and AI to empower young people. And this has huge benefits. We get more effective preparation of our young people by having them do hundreds of projects successfully with real-world impact. We get young people who are happier and more engaged and energized, and we get a constantly improving world, because that's what young people do, unlike today. 
And the best part is that it works for all, that everybody in the world, no matter what their economic level or technology level, can find projects to do that they're interested in, that they want to do, that make a positive impact on the world. It's already started. It's begun in the world. It's just in pockets. There's no single jurisdiction that does it anywhere, but it needs to be cultivated and encouraged. And that's why we have stood up the Global Institute for Empowerment, Accomplishment, and Impact by Young People. It's an action-oriented R&D group. I think most of us agree we're entering a new age. And I look at it in this way. About 100,000 years ago, humans finished evolving anatomically. We were more or less the same then as we are now. But since then, we've evolved post-biology by adding new capabilities. Some people talk about the Stone Age and the Iron Age and the Bronze Age. I like Will Durant's formulation of the peaks of human progress. So humans have added speech and fire and tamed animals and agriculture and social organization and morality and tools and science and writing and print. And the latest before this was education, which now is around the world. And now we're adding digital and AI. And each new capability requires both reframing and recalibration. It's a different environment with a change of climate, new information, huge capabilities, online connections, new social structures. And there are new questions. What does this age of digital and AI mean for young people? What reframings and recalibrations will help them? What can we do to best equip today's and coming young humans for their future? Those are the questions on my mind. And the process that I use is to first reframe and then recalibrate. I'll mention the big reframings and some of the recalibrations that we need. So let's start with reframing young people's new age. A lot of people call it different things. Many call it the fourth industrial revolution. As of two days ago, the Anthropocene apparently officially started. John Hegel talks about a time of fear. I think that from the young people's perspective, it's a new age of empowerment. It's something that's very different from before. Not only is the climate change coming, more information analysis, all those things on the left, but I think we're gonna see big changes in very fundamental areas, identity, privacy, property, and that that is a great opportunity for young people because a much better way for them to grow up is to find their new beliefs and unique interests and new connections, to apply them to accomplishing with positive impact, and therefore to realize their dreams. And I hope we'll get there. But to get there, we're going to need to recalibrate what young people need, what they should do, how much old versus new we offer, how much self-direction versus how much control by adults. And these days, how we get more excitement rather than the fear and anxiety that we're seeing in too many young people around the world. So let's reframe their capabilities. It used to be we thought and young people thought that kids could do almost nothing that adds value until they grew up. So they needed to sit in classrooms and learn in advance. Now, young people can add real world value with measurable positive impact starting in their earliest years. We have videos of kids doing it starting age three. The young people are getting both new capabilities and new attitudes. And the capabilities are the technical side, the devices, the internet, the YouTube, generative AI. And not everybody has those yet, but everybody is starting to have and can have the new attitudes. And that's I can, I choose, I accomplish, I see positive impact. So that is why everybody can do this as gradually the capabilities evolve. And it means we need to recalibrate what young people think and what they can do, their and our expectations, how they spend their time, what we want and what we assess. Now, a lot of this goes back to beliefs. For a long time, it was believed that adults can, but kids can't. Well, that's the way we ran the world. 
We didn't give kids responsible jobs. Now we're starting to see young people think I can, I choose, and I accomplish. So we're starting to see them do much more important and powerful and impactful things at much younger ages. And I think they're changing generationally in a huge number of areas. And I formulated this list with cultural anthropologists. These are all the areas where beliefs are changing generationally. So much so that I think a generational belief divide is emerging that's more important than the digital divide. Because the digital we can provide, it will come eventually, but belief change is harder. It's very hard when people are old. It's much easier when they're young. And it's belief change that creates a different future. I've thought about what some of the uh, parts of this beliefs divide are. They're very important and they're very different. And just to give you an example, one of the 10 books is a book for young people started out as beliefs for 21st century kids, morphed into digital natives rising. And here are some of the pages. The unique set of dreams and passions and strengths and capabilities. I can understand my uniqueness, apply it to bettering in the world. I have the power to create positive change. I can and will take my dreams as seriously as I want to. My goal is to become a good, effective, world-improving person. I'll make my human and technology components work well together to solve problems. There are about 20 more pages to that. The book is free online at this URL. It's in multiple languages. I'm happy to translate it into any new language. And I have copies in print for purchase. If you're interested, please contact me. This means we need to recalibrate our own beliefs. How much of the new beliefs we want to accept, whether we join or whether we resist, let's reframe who the young people are. A lot of people think of them as the same people that we've been for so long, but just now we have some new tools. We have AI tools, we have technology tools. I think it's much more useful to look at them as symbiotic hybrids, to look at this new technology as a part of us that we don't fully know how to use well, but we're learning. And I think this becoming hybrids, this hybridization is happening very quickly. There are a lot of things in that left column that are already symbiotic. We wouldn't do most of those things without a machine. The things in the middle are absolutely on their way. There are ways to do them with our machine parts. And although the things on the right are not yet symbiotic, like loving and caring and feeling, they may move in those directions. And the big question mark, I think, is at the bottom, it's creativity. How much is creativity a hybrid function rather than just a biological human function? So I think we need to recalibrate what we keep in our heads and what we delegate to our machine parts, what we allow in terms of what machines we can have with us and how they are part of our body, how we behave with them, and the question of fear versus trust of these things. Now, there's a question about where young people live. That's a good reframe because we used to live only in Earth and only in our imagination. Those were our two places to live. Now we have three places. We have Earth, imagination, and the cloud. And that's a big deal because we need to recalibrate the value of each world and especially how they interact and combine and how much time we want to spend in each of those worlds. And when we think about the future world, we have to reframe that world and the aspirations of young people because it used to be a world of repetition. It used to be a world of generational replacement. Somebody died, somebody new got their job. It used to be a world where experience was therefore very valuable. I think we're moving to a new frontier, which requires continuous invention. And I think that means we need to recalibrate how much replacement we still need, what's the value of experience that we all have for the future, how much of that is useful, how much of that is not useful, 
what are useful behaviors like entrepreneurship? What are the new rules? What are the new questions to ask? What's universal? For a long time, we thought that academic success was universal. Everybody could do it. We just had to bring education to their part of the world and let them in. Well, it turns out that's not true. Not everybody is good at academics. But everybody, every person in the world, I think, is good at real world accomplishment at some level. If you ask them and you find out what they really want to accomplish, they can do it and we can help them do it. So we need to recalibrate how much real world accomplishments young people should have as they grow up. The idea of accomplishing, doing, is becoming much more important in our new world. And therefore, I think we have to relabel our young people. Because when we call them kids or children or students or learners, that's a put down. That's saying we know more than them. We are better than them. They're in an earlier pre- adult stage, and that's not the same, when in reality, they're really people, and they happen to be young, and while they're not fully formed with all the experiences they'll have, they certainly have all the anatomy, and the interesting part is that they don't have the fully formed prefrontal cortex, which may, in fact, be a feature and not a bug. That may be something that hurts us as adults in this new environment, rather than being something that helps us in this new environment. Often today, we treat our kids as pets. We tell them, especially when they're young, sit, go here, do this, be obedient, follow me, perform the tricks I taught you. That's what we do in school. But a lot of older kids, when if you say this to high school kids, they'll agree. So we need to recalibrate how much we continue steering young people into the what we want for them and not allowing them to self-direct and go in the directions that they know are important for them, with our guidance, of course. Now we come to learning, and this is, for me, the key to the whole thing, because for years, for decades, for centuries, We've thought about learning as an end in itself. The academic world says that's the product of education. Education is all about learning. How much learning did you get? How can we measure that? How much learning did you forget over the summer? Those are the conversations we have. But learning is really a means for accomplishing. And it's really a useful byproduct of accomplishing, in my view. And I think we need to reframe it because it's a huge mistake to have learning as our goal instead of accomplishing. Learning is nice, it's important, all those things, but we learn in order to accomplish useful things. So I think we need to recalibrate how much learning in advance versus how much accomplishment we do and learning as we do, how much time we spend testing, how much learning went in, which is what we spend a lot of young people's time doing. Same with skills. We talk about basic and hard and soft and 21st century skills. We have these categories. I reframe as task-specific versus transferable lifetime capabilities, which I call diamond skills. And this has been written up in a number of books. I think about effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment skills. And those skills are all lifelong. There are lots of them that humans have developed. You can't learn them in one shot in a course in school, but they're all very important. But we have to recalibrate not just the categories, but how much we emphasize the thinking skills versus the action relationship and accomplishment skills, because education has become all about thinking skills. And the other skills, equally important, are really left out of the picture. Take the basics, for example. We fought for lots of times with reading and writing and arithmetic. And those are still important in our current world but they're going away as basics. And my evidence for this is if one of us moved to China where we don't speak the language and we don't read and write the language, but we had our cell phone, we would function perfectly well. More slowly, of course, 
but the phone would do all the necessary translations and reading and writing that we needed in ways we could understand. So that basic is fading, but new basics are coming. And I think among other things, there's a new loop. I call it the accomplishment or ABCD loop of accomplishing useful things, bettering your world, considering how to do it better, and then doing it over and over again. We need to build up what I call Lego. They call it a toy. I call it love, empathy, gratitude, and optimism. These are things that we don't have enough of today. We need to do what Esther Wojcicki represents, if you know her, uh, as trick, trust, respect, independence, collaboration, and kindness, both ways from adults to young people, young people to adults. And we have to be much more ready than we are for continuous change because the era of replacement of just getting somebody else's job when you grow up is starting to be over. We need to reframe the curriculum because we've done it in terms of subjects and classes offered. We have course catalogs, but what we need are 2 billion or 3 billion individual curricula of continuous real world projects that fit each particular individual. We need to reframe parenting and being parented from the paradigm of ownership, which is really what we have. We can do everything with our kids in most cases, except sell them to curation, to thinking about our job as to curate these young people as they grow up. And so we come to reframing the viable alternative that I talked about. Right now we have schools and that's all we have. And they are all the same. School choice is a myth because all the schools are doing the same thing, reading and writing and math and language and science and social studies in different ways. What I propose as a, not an alternative, but as an option is empowerment hubs. They are an alternative, but not necessarily for everybody. They're for accomplishing with impact. And they can exist online or in organizations or in homes and schools, companies. They can have multiple brands. They don't all have to be called empowerment hubs. 4-H does a lot of this kind of thing. Some other organizations do. They're very different. What happens in those places is very different. They provide continuous self-selected real-world team projects. And we can arrange coaches for them like First Robotics does. They provide useful self-knowledge and learning as it is needed. So it becomes meaningful and best of all, a measurable positive impact on the world. If a hub exists someplace, that part of the world keeps getting better. There where young people can go to realize their dreams, to fix problems they care about, to help others, all things we don't do in school and we don't think young people are capable of today. So we're back to our goal, which is to prepare and equip young people for their future. Today's way is years of learning in advance, but it's not working well and the future will be different and our kids are already very different. So the question I keep asking is, can learning in advance, even with all the icing, ever meet our needs and our kids' needs? Or do we need an alternative option? I think we do. That's why we've stood up the Global Institute for Empowerment, Accomplishment, and Impact by Young People to take action. Our mission is to help institutions, politicians, and parents better prepare young people for their future by helping the world create an alternative, an option to academic schools, which we call generically empowerment hubs, so that the young people can realize their dreams and fix problems they care about and help others. And that alternative is clear. It's now, I've been curating it for years, but it needs more curation and research and development, encouragement and cultivation to become a universal option for young people, just like Montessori became a universal option for kids of a certain age. So we have this Global Institute for Empowerment, Accomplishment and Impact for Young People. We've already begun. We have a website, we have partners, we have databases, we have a lot of action going on. 
And if you agree, if you're a person who agrees that learning in advance doesn't work well for our future kids, and is at the root of the problem, it's not what we teach, it's what we do. And if you want to be part of creating a different and better for many alternative as a universal option for all young people in the world, wherever they are, and if you want to help curate and nurture the emergence of these empowerment hubs on every continent as a viable option for all young people, and not everybody does, we understand this is a subset of people. A lot of people have the old beliefs and want to do things in different ways. But if you are one of these people, we want to connect with you, and here's how to connect with me. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>